Well, I want to invite you to find Psalm 23 in your Bible, this famous psalm. We're looking at it over three Sunday mornings. We began that last week. Each Sunday, we're going to sing a different version of Psalm 23. You'll see the version that we're going to sing after the sermon this morning is uh, perhaps the most well-known, famous version in Scotland, uh, this version by William Whittington, Psalm 23 to the tune of Crimmond, the Aberdeenshire village uh, that has lent its name to this tune. William Whittington married John Calvin's sister in Geneva, pastored the English-speaking church uh, in Geneva, if that means anything to any of you. Uh, as you sing that together, it might help us as we treasure those wonderful words uh, in just a moment to know how long these words have comforted God's people for down through the centuries. And so let's read them together from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. We saw last week, what an astonishing thing to say. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, our Good Shepherd, in these moments together, we want to ask You to operate on our hearts. We all need You. Some of us particularly need you to show us something or help us with something. We all have things we need you to change. And so take our hand, we pray, and lead us and feed us. For your name's sake, we ask it. Amen. You might remember uh, last week I told you that I took the whole idea for this sermon series from Simon Sony, visiting Simon in hospital. Simon's uh, big operation before Christmas, he was reading Psalm 23 and reading one particular book that I told you about, a book called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. And over the weeks as I visited Simon, as the idea for doing these sermons came to mind, uh, I I chose an image to go with the sermon. Some of you will have seen it. It went sent out in the email. If you look at the sermon uh, on our website, you'll find the image that goes with this particular sermon series. It's uh, a mountaintop with a valley in the middle. And I, I loved all the ideas for this sermon series coming together. I went in to see Simon in hospital, and I had this image on my phone. And as we were talking about it, I, I proudly showed Simon the picture that I'd chosen to go with the sermon series. No, 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 Simon said, that's not right. That's not it. The reason I picked that picture is precisely because of verse 4 this morning. The valley of the shadow of death. You know, if, you put, if you put Psalm 23 into Google Images, just put Psalm 23 into Google, click on Images, you will be drowned in images of lambs and green fields and all things nice, which before we complain about that, remember what I said last week, that Psalm 23 is famous because of verse 4, especially at funerals. But in fact, the psalm is a psalm about life and flourishing, isn't it? It's a, it's a psalm about food and safety and plenty. But I wanted a picture of a valley to go with the sermon series. I wanted a valley because more than anything today, I want to show you how strong the Lord Jesus Christ is. That's my aim. I am the good shepherd, Jesus said. Do you know why he's good, friends? Because he's invincible. 
He's good because he has been through the valley of the shadow of death himself. And now he lives in the power of an indestructible life. And in all the darkness of your life and my life, the one who lives forever is there. And we need that, don't we? I need that. You need that. No, 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 said Simon, as I showed him the picture, my, my valley. Simon said, look, th that hillside that you've got in your picture, it looks like you could just do nice roly-polies down it, all the way down the hill to the bottom. The valley in my mind, Simon said, the valley in my mind is the valley of the shadow of death in Pilgrim's Progress. Do you know it? I hope somewhere at home you've got an illustrated copy of Pilgrim's Progress. I saw in my dream that Christian had now to enter another valley, the darkest valley he had yet encountered. It was a very lonely place where there was no water. No one lived there, and its silence was the silence of the grave. Here, Christian was to be more sternly tested than ever. You know, when I, when I got home from visiting Simon, I opened my copy of Pilgrim's Progress, The Valley of the Shadow of Death, in the, the animated, the illustrated version that I have, the valley of the shadow of death ha has a valley in which nobody is doing roly-polies. It is a snaking path that is cut through a ravine with an abyss on either side, an abyss of darkness. The only light on the page comes from the mouth of hell. There are the nets of traps and pitfalls. There is a, a pile of skulls and mangled bones lying outside a cave. Oh, that is John Bunyan's attempt to capture with his mind's eye the meaning of that phrase in verse 4, the valley of the shadow of death. If you're using the church Bible, the black Bibles, you'll see a little footnote down to the bottom of your page. The, the, the Hebrew for that phrase is the valley of deep darkness. Darkness is bad, isn't it? But deep darkness. Some of you have been there. Bereavement, grief, depression, profound disappointment in life. Pandemic, loss, trauma, abuse. And King David here, David the shepherd, puts down his own staff and he calls himself a sheep and he stares at those valleys and he sees the darkness and he says it is deep darkness and as he prepares to face it, he says, I will fear no evil. Isn't that remarkable? That's the personal confession at the heart of today's sermon. Last week I said there are three great confessions in this psalm. That's what we're looking at. Confession number one, verse one, I shall not want. Confession number three, verse six, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Here's today's confession of faith. I will fear no evil. Charles Spurgeon said, this unspeakably delightful verse has been sung on many a dying bed and has helped to make the darkest valley bright. Here's today's confession. I will fear no evil. Why not? Why is it possible to say that? I want to give you three reasons this morning. Number one, look how the shepherd leads. Look how the shepherd leads. Number two, look where the shepherd is. And number three, look what the shepherd holds. Look what he holds. See, even just giving you those three things, I hope if you look at verse four again, just giving you those three things, I hope you feel a map for the verse appearing right in front of you. Look at, it, look at the verse again as I give you those three, three things. Look how the shepherd leads. Look where he is. Look what he holds. So here's the first one. Look how the shepherd leads. You know, you, th there are surprises here. Surprises straight away as we look at it. La last week I said, look where the shepherd leads. Verse 3, he leads me where? In paths of righteousness. There is no wholeness 
with Jesus without holiness. There is no soul restored by Jesus without righteousness given by Jesus. Unless we walk in His ways and on His paths, we will not get all the joys and comforts of verses 1 to 3. And so we get to the end of verse 3, and we think, yeah, okay, I've got that. He leads me in paths of righteousness. And here's the big surprise today. Those paths of righteousness in verse 3 sometimes include the deep darkness of verse 4. The valley of the shadow of death does not mean you have left the path of righteousness. It is where the path of righteousness can sometimes lead. You see that? Isn't that a surprise? As Jesus and his disciples were proceeding on their journey, someone ran up to him and said, I will follow you wherever you go. Really? Where are you going, Lord? To Jerusalem to die. Oh, so, so often we want higher ground with God, don't we? we? We want to get above the mundane, beyond it. We want to be beyond the ordinary. We want the mountaintop experience with God. Surely the path of righteousness is going to take us up out of the muck of life and out of the mess and out of the sorrow. David shows us a shepherd this morning who puts us on the path to his eternal home, and as he does that, he leads us down through the valley of the shadow of death. I want you to know, friends, this morning that the valley you are in, if you are, is God's valley. And the shepherd has led you there. You you might be lost and you might be in darkness, but the Lord Jesus is not standing beside you this morning, scratching his head, wondering what's gone wrong, wondering where he is. And it may not yet be a part of your theological framework, but it needs to be that all things, including the valley, come from God's fatherly hand. For if they didn't, God is not in charge of the valley. If He is not in charge of the valley, how do you know He can get you through it? A little while ago, I started listening, uh, when I was walking the dog in the mornings, I started listening to some of uh, the Ask Pastor John podcast. Some of you will have listened to them, John Piper's Uh, many years as a pastor, people send in questions, and in five or ten minutes, he tries to answer them. And I was just listening to lots of them walking the dog one morning, and one one of the questions to him was, I'm a youth pastor. What should my priority be in church with my young people? We all know what youth pastors tend to do, don't we, with young folks, Uh, kind of theological sugar rushes. John Piper said this, he said, if you are a youth pastor, you have one main job. It is to give small people big God theology. To give small people big God theology, show them how majestic God is, how awesome He is, how mighty He is. Give them the theology of Amos chapter 3, verse 6. Do you remember when we looked at it? Amos chapter 3, does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it, unless the Lord has done it. God stands behind everything that happens in the world, everything, absolutely everything, but He does not stand behind good and evil in exactly the same way, so that when disaster strikes a city, it is always the Lord's doing in one sense, even while at the same time He is never the author of evil. He remains in control of everything while he is not tainted in his glory by the evil that we do. Adam and Eve's fall into sin did not take God by surprise. He did not send the Lord Jesus into the world as plan B. Do you remember Revelation 13 when we looked at it? What did John see in his vision? The lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Not an astonishing thing to say. In God's mind, the, the eye of his mind, the lamb is slain before the foundations of the world are laid. 
Oh, the deepest, darkest valley, friends, that there has ever been, the darkest valley there has ever been, came on a hill outside Jerusalem where the eternal Son, joined to human nature, would descend into the abyss of death for His people. Oh, if God planned that valley and had a purpose for that valley, then my valley and your valley is perfectly in His hands. Some of you this week will have received the trainer's latest newsletter from the United States. Ben has kept us updated, their time over there, their third year, and so many changed plans. They haven't made it back once yet, have they, in three years, despite hoping to be back every summertime. And Ben opened his prayer letter with words that we're going to say together next Sunday from the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 10 on Providence. Here's the question, what do you understand by the providence of God? Here's the answer. Providence is the almighty and ever-present power of God by which He upholds as with His hand heaven and earth and all creatures, and He so rules them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty, all things in fact come to us not by chance, but from His fatherly hand. Next question, how does the knowledge of God's creation and providence help us? Answer, we can be patient when things go against us, thankful when things go well, and for the future we can have good confidence in our faithful God and Father that nothing will separate us from His love. All creatures are so completely in His hand that without His will, they can neither move nor be moved. That's why we do not fear. You you know, it's why David says, even though I walk, notice, even though I walk through the valley, through your valley this morning, friends, Whatever it is, from depression to death, your valley is not the destination. It is just part of the journey. For the Lord Jesus, it was the cross, then the crown. For us, it is suffering, then glory. Whatever the valley you are walking in this morning, you are walking through it. The Lord Jesus is not up ahead of you asking for directions, He's not lost. And you see, when we see all of this, that when we see that the shepherd leads us into the valleys, that they're his valleys, that he's leading us through the valleys, then even the word walk is significant. Even the word walk is significant. Spurgeon said, every word in verse 4 is a world of meaning. You know, know, sometimes in our house, you you ask one of the, the, the children, the smaller children, just could you nip upstairs and get, get me my glasses? I've got my muddy shoes on or something. Run up and get me my glasses. And depending on the time of day, if the house is dark, do you remember that feeling? Even the top of the house is a scary place to get to. Sometimes the child will pluck up courage and they're going to go and get the glasses. And what do they do in the darkness? They run. Let's see if we can do it. Get there and back before somebody, something terrible happens. They run. It's kind of a test, isn't it? What kind of person walks in darkness? What kind of person walks? Listen to Charles Spurgeon. It is as though David is telling us that the believer does not quicken his pace even when he comes to die, but still calmly walks with God. To walk indicates the steady advance of a soul which knows its road, knows its end, resolves to follow the path, feels quite safe, and is therefore perfectly calm and composed. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I did a student suppers, uh, I attended student suppers in the evening for a grill the minister evening, and one of the questions I was asked was what, what is the best and worst things about being a minister? If I could change the question, you can't really do that when people ask you questions, but the, the question I would like to answer is, what is, 
What is the best and worst things about being a shepherd? Do you know what one of the best things, one of the greatest privileges I've ever had in my life, do you know what it is? It is to see the steady advance of a soul which knows its end. To watch somebody walk towards death. Many of you friends have done that. Many of you have done it. You've done it holding the hand of a loved one, and their journey has become your journey, and you have walked. And it is one of the greatest privileges of, of, of being a shepherd to see that happen. Look how the shepherd leads. Number two, look where the shepherd is. So simple, so beautiful. I will fear no evil for you are with me. Where is the shepherd? With me, with me. Notice here the change from the third person that's happened in verses 1 to 3. Verses 1 to 3 is all he and me, he and me. Now it changes to the second person, you and me. David has stopped telling us about the shepherd, and now he's talking to the shepherd. The shepherd is no longer ahead to lead. He, he's now beside to escort. Having somebody with you in the darkness is all that matters, isn't it? It's all that matters. We discovered over the half-term holidays the TV program Alone. Some of you have seen that? You've watched that? It happens in other parts of the world. An amazing TV series. You, you, you drop 10 people on an island and the person who lasts the longest wins the prize money. Half, half a million pounds it was, but I think it's gone up now. It's a million pounds you can win. And the places that you are dropped, friends, you're, you're not dropped in Seton Park or Westburn Park. Gr Grizzly Island, British Columbia, is where you're dropped. W work out why that is. One million pounds, one million dollars if you last the longest. Do you know what gets people in the end? It's not the bears. It's not, the, it's not even the cold. It's not the lack of food. What breaks people in the end? And, and by the way, it's not you and me being dropped here. These are hardened outdoor experts, people who know how to hunt and shoot and kill. What gets people at the end is the name of the program alone. As the days pass and the weeks pass, the, the things that they say to, ca to camera become more and more and more about their family, the people that they've left behind, their loved ones. They are alone. You know, John Calvin says, he looks at this verse, verse 4, he says, he looks at it, he says, do you know what? Think about it. David fears no evil because of where the shepherd is with him. He feared no evil because he cast himself on the shepherd's protection, and this implies that he had been afflicted by fear. In other words, David has taken his natural fear to God. He, he would have no need of Christ's presence or of his rod or of his staff if he was perfectly unafraid himself, would he? No, no, no the, the picture in verse 4 is not of a strong sheep, but it's a sheep trembling in the valley with danger on every hand, but then the sheep hears the shepherd's voice, and he senses the shepherd's presence, and he feels the shepherd's tools, and then the sheep calms. Then the sheep does not fear. I said last week, friends, that your sense in verse 3 of your soul being restored, your sense of your soul being restored will be directly proportional to your need to be in Christ's presence, the, the time that you spend with Him. It's the same here, the fear that you feel, the fear that we feel will always be directly proportional to our being in the shepherd's presence, to, to the amount that we come in and go out with Him, to our easy familiarity with the Lord Jesus and His Word and His people and His means of grace in preaching, praying, receiving the Lord's Supper, celebrating baptism, all the things that give you God's living presence. Familiarize yourselves with those things. Live in them. The less fear there will be in the valley, for you are 
with me. Do you know, friends, that is the message of the whole Bible summarized in five words. For you are with me. Martin Luther said that the Psalms are a little Bible. The Psalms are a little Bible, and they are a summary of the Old Testament. Well, I think that for you are with me is a little Bible, isn't it? In Eden, God lived with Adam and Eve. On Mount Horeb, God promised Moses that he would be with him in Egypt. At Mount Sinai, God came to live with Israel in a tent. In the promised land, God came to live with Israel in a temple. In the Lord Jesus, God came to live with his people. What does the name Emmanuel mean? God with us. When the Lord left this world, he sent his Holy Spirit to come and live in us to be with us. How does the story end, the new heavens and the new earth? God will once again live with his people, and now the dwelling of God is with us. It's a story in a nutshell, isn't it? For you are with me. That is where the comfort lies. God is with you today, with me. I'm sorry today to keep talking about my kids. These are, these are the illustrations that just came most quickly to mind. You know, I, I, after we watched, we were watching alone all the way through. And of course, what happens in the family living room is you watch it and you say to one another, how long would you last? Could you do it? And we had all sorts of very grand um, projections, shall we say. And soon after, one we were watching the we were watching the program. And one night we were out in town. I think we'd been to the cinema, driving home late, and we parked at our church, Queen Street Church. We got into the car and we were driving home. And I said to the children, "One million pounds, if I opened the door of the church and put you in there for one night, could you do it? Just one night. And if I was rich, I'd give you a million pounds." Well, I won't tell you what they said. I had to say to them, look, what if I came with you? What if I came with you? Do you think we could do it then? Totally different experience, isn't it? To have somebody bigger than you, stronger than you, somebody who loves you, who knows you, who, who will not leave you with you. Look how he leads. Look where he is. Number three, friends, look what he holds. Look what the shepherd holds. You know, if you see a woman in green or blue scrubs and with a stethoscope around her neck, you know who you're looking at, don't you? A man comes into your house to fix something, and he's got a, a hammer and a saw and a chisel and a measuring tape hanging around his waist on his tool belt. You, you hope he's not coming to fix your computer. You know, what, what the person holds reveals what they do. Your good shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, this morning has got something in each hand, and you need him to have both of these things. Look what he holds, a rod and a staff. A rod and a staff. You know, they, 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 those two things help us to get shepherds right, don't they? There's a man called J.M. Porter once met shepherds from this region of the world that King David is from many centuries later, just in the 19th century. But he met shepherds in this part of the world. And here's how he describes the shepherds. The shepherds themselves had none of that peaceful and placid aspect which is generally associated with pastoral life and habits. Now, the shepherds I saw looked like warriors marching to the battlefield, a long gun slung from the shoulder, a dagger and heavy pistols in the belt, a light battle axe or iron-headed club in the hand. Such were their equipments, and their fierce flashing eyes and scowling countenances showed but too plainly that they were prepared to use their weapons at any moment. Somebody has put it like this, the Lord Jesus, our shepherd, is no emaciated weakling. He is a warrior, as shepherds had to be. King David going out to fight Goliath, by that time, what had he done? slain the lion and the bear. Nobody can snatch my sheep out of my hand, the Lord Jesus said. John chapter 10, the muscles of his arm are flexed to defend his flock. 
He is obviously enough for whatever the valley throws at us. You know, some of us this morning need to remember what is on the other side of the valley, on the other side of the abyss. Some of us need to remember this morning where the journey ends and how the story finishes. What happens when you keep going through and down a bit more and through and down a bit more into the valley and through? What happens on the other side? Do you remember how the story ends, the book of Revelation? What did we say? The lamb wins. The lamb wins. That is how the story ends. Some of us this morning are weak, aren't you? You, you, you feel pretty broken. Circumstances, life, li life has just kind of pressed us down. I want to remind you of Isaiah chapter 42. This shepherd, God's servant, will not break a bruised reed. He will not snuff out a smoldering wick. He is strong even if you are weak, and He is tender to all your brokenness. Let Jesus' rod comfort you. Let it put strength into you. Look at His other hand, friends. A rod is not the only thing in Jesus' hands. He holds a staff. See, a, a rod was a rod was like a cudgel worn at the belt. A staff is held in the hand to round up the sheep and to pull the sheep in. One instrument for defense, the other instrument for discipline. The, the, the shepherd's staff is the equivalent of the dog walker's lead, isn't it? Controlling the animal, keeping the animal near, on the right path, pulling and pushing and prodding and defending through discipline. We need to hear this, don't we? We need both from the Lord Jesus, defense and discipline, safety and correction. You know, I think it's true. Some of us just want Jesus to protect us from our enemies with His rod. We don't want Jesus to protect us from ourselves with His staff. What's my greatest enemy this morning? my own sinful heart, my love of myself, my self-pity, my lusts, my, my constant distorted belief that the grass is greener somewhere else, my deeply twisted subtle belief that the path of righteousness is not the path of happiness. Oh, I need a staff this morning. Don't you? Pull me back in, Lord Jesus. Pull me to you. Somebody did that to me this weekend. Somebody, uh, I was interacting with a close friend, telling them about recent events, described a situation to, the, to them, and they just lovingly, gently, o over, uh, what's the word, over the ether, electronically, through email, just extended the shepherd's staff. No, 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 that, that's not right. You need to change something there, David. Some, some of us have wandered off the shepherd's paths of righteousness, and we're grazing in fields that we know we shouldn't be in. And if we're honest, we're kind of wondering how on earth we got here. We never thought we'd end up doing this. We're, we're in a relationship we know we shouldn't be in. We're thinking about getting into one that we know we shouldn't be getting into. And because we're in that position, we, we know that there is just some new distance that, is, that has just appeared between us and the shepherd. There's, there's just a distance now that wasn't there months ago or years ago. And there's now a distance between us and the other sheep. It's all because we've put ourselves beyond the reach of his staff. We're not reading our Bibles as much as we used to. We're not in church as much as we used to. Here's the big one. We're, we're not listening to the loving rebukes or the advice of Christian friends the way we used to. We're, we're, we're just ducking and diving to keep ourselves out of the reach of the hook of that staff. 
Oh, oh, make no mistake, we still like being associated with this group of sheep. We like the church. We haven't left it yet, but we're just not quite within reach. The rod and the staff are not comforting us. You know, ch church members are often, church folks are often surprised to discover that the elders of your church hold both rod and staff in their hands. So it's why elders meet together. It's, you know, it's, it's common to like the idea, isn't it, of elders fending off the wolves for us. We like that. Keep, keep false teaching out of the church, thank you. But then we get a surprise when we feel the shepherd's staff on the shoulder. Just tell me about you and the Lord at the minute. What's happening? Where are you with Him right now? Things don't seem to be right. Come back. Maybe it's time to speak to someone this morning, today, this week. You know, some of you have told me this past week that, that the psalm, this psalm is, is working like a reset button for you. Not just at the start of the year, but just for you and the Lord generally. It's a wonderful thing to have heard. Maybe for all of us today, it is time to click refresh and to come home. Maybe it's time to look up and see who is with you. Maybe you've forgotten who is with you. All you can see is darkness. Maybe it's time to look ahead and to keep walking with Him. Amen.